Wichita Liberty TV, featuring host Bob Weeks. Local politics without the spin. Interviews with nationally respected economists. Hear directly from Kansas conservatives about what matters to you. It's individual liberty, limited government, and free markets. Wichita Liberty TV. Hello, I'm Bob Weeks for Wichita Liberty TV, your weekly source for news, analysis, and commentary about Wichita and Kansas government and public affairs. Broadcast on Great Plains Television, channel 26.1, also its companion website, kgpt26.com. Some of you may know me for my blog, that's the Voice for Liberty on the internet at wichitaliberty.org. The motto there is individual liberty, limited government, free markets, and economic freedom in Wichita and Kansas. If you'd like to learn more about the issues covered today or to contact me, well, please visit wichitaliberty.org. You can subscribe to the email newsletter, like the Voice for Liberty on Facebook, and follow me, Bob Weeks, on Twitter. Well, this week, a records request to the city of Wichita results in data as well as insight into the city's attitude towards empowering citizens with data. Here's what happened. One of the reforms in government over the past several decades are open records laws. At the federal level, it's called the Freedom of Information Act, or FOIA. States generally have their own versions of the law. In Kansas, it's known as the Kansas Open Records Act, or CORA. These laws give citizens the right to inspect or receive certain government records, such as contracts, checks, correspondence, and the like. A few months ago, I asked the city of Wichita for checkbook spending records and I received data for 2015 through September 25th, which was when I made the request. And I've made the data available to the public on my website in a visualization using Tableau Public. And by using this visualization, you can do things like sort and drill down on the data and generally explore to see what's there. Well, analyzing and understanding this data does require a bit of local knowledge. For example, there is a vendor named Visit Wichita that started to receive monthly payments in March. Well, what about January and February? Well, payments for those months were made to a vendor named Go Wichita, which then changed its name to Visit Wichita. And similarly, there are payments made to both Westar Energy and Westar Energy EDI. These are the same entities, just as Visit Wichita and Go Wichita are the same entity. And to the city's credit, the matching pairs have the same vendor number, which is good, but resolving that requires a different level of analysis. And there are some interesting entities. For example, the city usually sends a few hundred dollars per month to the Kansas Turnpike Authority. That seems reasonable, as city employees travel on the turnpike. Then in July, the city paid $3.7 million to the Turnpike Authority. And a quick search of city council agenda packets did not reveal any reason for this. So it would be good to know why the city paid this money to the Turnpike. And I'm not suggesting any malfeasance. I'm just curious, as I hope you are. Because that's a significant amount that was spent. And one of the things about making data available is that perhaps citizens will become interested in knowing more about their government and will ask these types of questions. Of note, it looks like there were 474 checks issued in the amount of $20 or less. And Bank of America has estimated that the cost of sending a business check ranges from $4 to $20. So the city may often spend, say, $10 in order to pay someone $8. Now, the city supplied this data to me in a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet and in an arrangement that can easily be analyzed in Excel or loaded into other programs. This is a step forward. Two years ago, when I requested similar spending records, Wichita could supply data of only limited utility. What was supplied to me was data in PDF form as images, not text. 
Even using optical character recognition, it would be difficult to translate the image data into machine-readable text, and even more difficult to reorganize it to a useful format, format or arrangement for analysis. Also, I had to pay $24 to the city for this data. That's a problem because it is by now routine for government agencies to post spending data like this, but not at the city of Wichita. And when I inquired, city officials told me that the present financial management system does not include any modern system features such as an open checkbook. Well, an open checkbook refers to a modern web interface where citizens can query for specific data and perhaps perform other analysis. An example is Denver's open checkbook. Now, while the next generation Wichita financial system will probably have such a feature, an open checkbook, there is no reason why citizens cannot experience some of the benefits now. The spreadsheet of spending data like that I paid for could easily be posted on the city's website on a monthly basis. It would take just a moment each month to do that. And people will take that data and make it more useful as I did. There is no reason why this should not be happening. Now, when I learned of the fee for these records, I asked for a waiver sending this request to the city's record official. I wrote, I'd like to ask for a waiver of the requested fee. I ask because this check register, register data is an example of records that many governmental agencies make freely available on their websites. The Wichita Public School District and Sedgwick County are two local examples. I also wrote that I'd like to also call attention to the United States Freedom of Information Act, which allows for fee waivers in some circumstances. That act says fee waivers are limited to situations in which a requester can show that the disclosure of the requested information is in the public interest because it is likely to contribute significantly to public understanding the, of the operations activities of the government and is not primarily in the commercial interest of the requester. Well, I suggested to the city that the records I am requesting will indeed contribute significantly to public understanding of the operations and activities of the government, and that it is, in fact, in the interest, the public interest of the people of Wichita, that these records be freely available. Well, I received an answer. It said, your request for waiver of fees is denied. CORA, that's the Kansas Open Records Act, allows fees to be collected prior to finding and producing the document that you seek. The extensive statute set setting out how fees are to be determined does not contain any provision for waiver in the manager manner you suggest. The city will provide the document to you upon payment as invoice. Sincerely, Jay Hinkle, Deputy City Attorney. And that's the response I got from the city of Wichita. And I have to say, Mr. Hinkle is absolutely 100% correct. Governmental agencies in Kansas have the right to charge for records, and the Kansas statutes do not mention the waiving of fees, as do the federal statutes. But the Kansas Open Record Act does not require cities to charge for providing records, especially for records that the city should already be providing for free on its website and especially when citizens are willing to take that data and make it better at no charge to the city. So Mr. Hinkle provided a lawyer's answer. Here, however, is the public policy the city promotes from a Wichita City News rela release from 2013. It says, the city council has stressed the importance of transparency for this organization, city manager Robert Layton said and went on to say that we will continue to empower and engage citizens by providing information necessary to keep them informed on the actions their government is taking on their behalf. Okay, did you hear that? The city talked about the importance of transparency. The city says it wants to empower and engage citizens by providing information. Well, I offered to contribute significantly to public understanding of the operations and activities of the government, but I had to pay to do so.
And when I asked city officials for clarification of why I had to pay to receive these records, the city's communications staff told me I should note that the city has won multiple awards for openness and citizen participation, but city leaders recognize this work is never done. They strive each and every day to become more open and transparent and will continue to do so. Well, I just have to disagree. This, what the city has done, is not open and transparent government. This is not how to empower and engage the people of Wichita, not even close. The city has a lot of work to do regarding making records and information available to citizens. But the rhetoric coming from City Hall leads me to believe that our elected officials and bureaucrats think they are doing a good job. If they truly believe that, well, we have a big problem. And if they don't believe that, why are they not being truthful with us? And on this topic, I have to confess that I owe Uncle Sam an apology. In January, I requested records from the United States Department of Energy. And a few weeks ago, when Congressman Mike Pompeo was the guest here on Wichita Liberty TV, I mentioned how I had not yet received my records. Well, a look back through my email found that I had received the records in August, so I apologize for overlooking that. And as you can see in this example page from the records I received, the government has the right to withhold or redact certain types of information. That's the purpose of all the black boxes. Many of the pages I received are almost totally black. What was not redacted is the type of information that can easily be found at other sources. So the value of the 114 pages I received in response to my records request is practically nothing. At the local level, the city of Wichita and its surrogates have used loopholes in the Kansas Open Records Act to exclude entire classes of records from release to the public. That's a problem, and ones that so far the Kansas legislature has been unwilling to address. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. A Wichita real estate developer seeks to have taxpayers fund a large portion of his development costs using a wasteful government program of dubious value. Here's what's happening. When you hear of a program titled Historic Preservation Tax Credits, you might find yourself in agreement. Preserving history. Who could be against that? And tax credits. Aren't those just technical adjustments on someone's tax form? If you look closely, however, you'll find that the Historic Preservation Tax Credits program can include buildings with only the slightest historic significance and at great cost to taxpayers. The Colorado Derby Building at 201 North Water Street in Wichita has been nominated for placement on the Register of Historic Kansas Places. Now this is a nondescript building which currently houses administrative offices for the Wichita Public School District and is known by a different name. Still, it is eligible for placement on the register for being an example of this private investment trend, that being the building of office buildings mid-century. A laudable accomplishment, but hardly notable and historic. Now, the real reason for seeking placement on the Register of Historic Places is money, pure and simple. By using historic preservation tax credits, the developer of this building can get taxpayers to pay for much of the cost of rehabilitation, almost half, which will be several millions of dollars in this case. Under the program this building is entering, its owners will receive 25% of rehabilitation expenses. The federal government provides tax credits of another 20%. And it's likely that the owners of this building will also seek these credits. So with both tax credit programs, 45% of the cost of rehabbing this building could be paid for by taxpayers. 
and given the history of this developer, it's likely that he will find other ways to get taxpayers to pay for even more. Now, tax credits may be a mystery to many, but there is no doubt as to their harmful effect on state and federal budgets. When using tax credits, the government, conceptually, issues a slip of paper that says something like, the holder of this document may submit it instead of $500,000 when making a tax payment. So instead of paying taxes with actual money, the holder of the credit pays with, well, a slip of paper that is worth nothing to the government treasury. If someone owed, say, $800,000 in taxes, they could pay their taxes with a check for $300,000 and with the tax credit worth $500,000. Well, except the tax credit has no worth to the state. These tax credits are a direct cost to the government, according to both Reason and the Kansas Division of Legislative Post Audit. A few years ago, after conducting an audit of the Kansas tax credit programs, auditors explain tax credits, which the government offers to try to induce certain actions by the taxpayer, reduce income tax revenues because they are subtracted directly from the amount of taxes due. But still, the confusing nature of tax credits leads citizens to believe that they have no cost to the state or federal government. It's true, the state does not write a check to the recipient of a tax credit. But still, the tax credits are equivalent to government spending. The problem is that by mixing spending programs with taxation, some people are led to believe that tax credits are not cash handouts. But not everyone falls for this seductive trap. In an article in Cato's Institute's Regulation magazine, there was an explanation saying specialists from these synthetic government spending programs, they call them tax expenditures. And tax expenditures are really spending programs, not tax rollbacks, because the missing tax revenues must be financed by more taxes on someone else. Tax expenditures dissolve the boundaries between government revenues and government spending. They reduce both the coherence of the tax law and our ability to conceptualize the very size and activities of our government. Okay, did he catch that? Tax credits, tax expenditures, are really a sleight of hand. The use of tax credits to pay for economic development incentives leads many to believe that what government is doing is not a direct subsidy or payment. In order to clear things up, well, maybe should we, we should require that government write checks instead of issuing credits. Well, back to Kansas. The audit of the Historic Preservation Tax Credits Program found that in 2001, when the program was started, the anticipated cost to the state was about $1 million per year. By 2007, the actual cost to the state was reported at almost $8.5 million. And further, the audit found what many people already knew. Tax credits are not an efficient way of transforming or transferring subsidy to developers. Most of the time, the developers sell the tax credits to someone else at a discount. As the audit explains, it said, the historic preservation tax credit is not cost effective. The amount of money an historic preservation project receives from the credit is dependent upon the amount of money it's sold for. Our review showed that on average, when historic preservation credits were transferred to generate money for a project, they only generated 85 cents for the project for every dollar of potential tax revenue the state gave up. Yes, so most of the time when developers receive tax credits, they sell them to someone else and at a discount. So it would be more efficient for everyone if the state would simply write checks to the developers instead of issuing tax credits. But then the actual and truthful economic meaning of the transaction would be laid bare for all to see. Then what qualifies as historic can change as political conditions require. 
Earlier this year, the Wichita City Council reversed a decision by the Historic Preservation Board and allowed a property owner to proceed with the demolition of three formerly historic buildings in southern downtown Wichita. At one time, these buildings were considered a treasure, essential to our heritage, but no longer. Someone made a different decision. The Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program is a government handout mechanism we no longer need. Today, most of the money goes to wealthy developers or corporations that can afford to redevelop downtown hotels and luxury loft apartments with their own money. But instead in Kansas, we ask low-income families to pay sales tax on their groceries to fund tax credits for wealthy developers. This is not the right thing to do. Welcome back to Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks. You may be aware that Kansas is in the process of trying to develop a new funding formula to pay for public schools, that is, kindergarten through 12th grade. I'm fearful that what will emerge will be only a slight variation on what we already have, and that no provision will be made to support more school choice programs in Kansas. So, what is school choice? Why is it good? Here's a video from the Heritage Foundation that explains. If you're like most consumers, you're probably very careful about how you spend your money. You compare products, weigh your options, and then make a decision. But what if this choice was taken away from you? This is school choice. Made simple. Brought to you by the Heritage Foundation. Consider the story of two towns, Choiceville and Districtville. In Choiceville, residents enjoy a wide variety of grocery shopping options. For example, at the Green Pea Market, Jill finds a large selection of vegetables. At the Big Steer Butcher, Jim purchases prime cuts of meat. And at the Mega Mart, Jenny buys bulk items for her large family. Each resident can choose the supermarket that best meets their needs. And because residents have a choice where they spend their grocery dollars, supermarkets in Choiceville try very hard to keep their customers happy. For example, at the market on 5th, customers enjoy fresh bread throughout the day. While at the West Side Market, customers can count on short lines and friendly cashiers. For residents in Choiceville, grocery shopping is a delight. Districtville, on the other hand, well, that's a different story. For as long as residents can remember, the town has been divided into districts. Residents are required to pay into a general fund, which then redistributes money to grocery stores in town. As a result, residents don't pay for groceries when they go to the store, but there's a catch. They may only shop at the store assigned to their geographic district. And because residents of Districtville can't choose the store that best meets their needs, Cindy has a hard time finding fresh vegetables. Tom can't get prime cuts of meat, and Sally has trouble purchasing large portions for her family. In fact, residents of Districtville often have trouble finding even basic staples to meet their needs, not to mention the terrible customer service, long lines, and reduced hours of operation. Without competition, grocery stores in Districtville have little incentive to keep their customers satisfied, and residents are not happy with the situation. Does Districtville sound a bit absurd? In many ways, it's not so different from how the U.S. education system works today. Money collected from taxpayers is used to fund public schools, which children are then assigned to by geographic location. This one-size-fits-all approach doesn't do a good job meeting needs, and the absence of competition often results in poor levels of service and lackluster academic performance. Fortunately, when we understand the problem, it's not difficult to identify a solution. Across America, more and more states are giving parents the freedom to choose how their education dollars are spent. School choice allows parents to choose a school that best meets their child's needs, whether public, private, virtual, charter, 
or homeschool, regardless of the specific zip code where they reside. This allows parents to spend their education dollars how they see fit. Studies have shown that when parents have a choice, academic performance and graduation rates tend to rise, and competition between schools creates a strong incentive for improvement. Finally, Parental choice ensures that all children have options. So, just because a child lives in a low-income neighborhood does not mean that that child has to attend a poorly performing school. If you'd like to learn more about school choice, please visit heritage.org slash made simple. In all areas of life, the best outcomes happen when consumers are empowered with options and choice. The public school establishment in Kansas tells us, however, that in the field of education, this is not true. Choice is bad, they say. Government is the best way to pay for and provide education. As the Kansas legislature starts its session in January, we need to let our leaders know that Kansas parents want choice for their children. That's because Kansas school children simply cannot afford to spend any more time trapped in government schools. Did you know that a good teacher will get a gain of learning of one and a half grade levels in one year, while bad teachers will get just half a year of gain? This means that if a child has two bad teachers before fourth grade, well, they are already one year behind the average student and potentially two years behind students fortunate enough to get two good teachers. There is a huge difference between the effectiveness of good teachers and bad teachers. But the system protects the teachers at the expense of school children. Any suggestion of treating teachers differently based upon merit is rejected as not being fair to teachers. This must end. We have to decide for whose benefit are our schools, the teachers or the students. And the one person best positioned to lead change in Kansas with regard to our schools is Governor Brownback. But so far, he has not shown leadership in school choice and reform. Well, that's all for this week on Wichita Liberty TV. I'm Bob Weeks.